I'm going to be talking about spinal vascular malformations. Um, I'm a cerebrovascular and endovascular surgeon uh, by trade. Uh, I trained with uh, Dr. Sansur, Dr. Skuin, and uh, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Oconquo at UVA. Um, so I'm looking at things from a different, uh, different angle. I have no disclosures. Other than I will not mention sagittal balance uh, for the next 30 minutes, I will not mention pelvic incidence or pelvic tilt. Uh, despite Chris Shaffrey drilling it into me for uh, seven years. But I may mention the word fusion, usually in the setting of they shouldn't have done that fusion. <laughs> uh, following that, uh, Chris Shaffrey used to talk about the uh, neck muscle, uh, meaning that the residents didn't really understand there was more than one muscle. Similarly, today we're going to talk about the spine artery. There is more than one. So we're going to describe a classification system of uh, shunting type vascular lesions. We're going to look at some uh, spinal vascular anatomy. It's important to know the basics. Uh, and then some uh, sort of characteristic imaging uh, findings that you see with spinal cord AVMs so that you don't miss these in clinical practice. Uh, and then we'll go through some of the diagnosis and treatment. These, usually, uh, these are pretty rare things, uh, but it's important to at least kind of know uh, that they exist so you know where to look them up. There's various uh, classification systems that have been used. Yesigal uh, started in 1969, and they're based on different things, histology, pathophys, or anatomic locations. Uh, the two that are uh, most popular are uh, introduced by Spetzer in 1992 and then revised in 2002. Uh, this is the one that I understand because it only goes to four. Uh, spinal dural AV fistulas, or type 1s. The type 2s are the intramedullary or glomus type. Uh, AVMs, and we're going to focus on those two. And then there's the more rare uh, juvenile uh, type 3s, uh, and then the type 4s or the uh, intradural per perimedullary AVFs. And then there's some others that are excluded from that classification system, uh, but were re included in the 2002 classification system, which uh, is just too big for me to remember. Uh, so, in terms of the vascular supply to the spinal column, this is what we're going to uh, focus on some of the basic anatomy, uh, the segmental arteries in the thoracic and lumbar spine, and of course the vertebral arteries uh, in, the, uh, in the neck. And the other lumbar artery that's important, there's a, a case of an AVM that I'll show later uh, off that vessel. Um, so in terms of the radicular arteries, we have the segmental uh, levels uh, in the thoracic and lumbar spine. The branches are the radicular medullary if they go to the anterior spinal, that's a single vessel, and then the radicular peels, which are paired vessels uh, to the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Uh, in terms of the anterior spinal, it gets contributions from the vertebral, uh, the ascending uh, and deep cervical arteries, as well as the thoracic and lumbar segmental arteries. And of course, the artery vademkiewicz, which I'll talk about uh, shortly, uh, and the artery of cer cervical enlargement, which is usually found at C5, C6. So those are two key vessels. The paired posterior spinal arteries number 10 to 20, uh, and they're off the midline. So on the angiogram, we can tell the ASA because it's right in the middle, and the posterior spinals are off to the side. So as long as you get your, uh, your x-ray completely lined up when you're shooting the angiogram, you can tell which is which, which is important for uh, embolization, for example. So here's just a cartoon of that showing the anterior spinal and then the paired posterior spinals uh, on the back. It's important to know the uh, variations of the artery vademkiewicz, uh, most commonly at T9 to T12 uh, on the left side, but there is variation uh, as shown in the uh, cartoon. This is uh, particularly important for um, cancer type operations, often Dr. Chapman or Dr. Hart uh, or Rod will ask us to uh, embolize a tumor uh, preoperatively. Uh, and so we identify the artery of the Emkiewicz, and it may change which side they put the cage in from. Um, uh, sometimes a radicular ve vessel has to be uh, taken with a bipolar. You definitely don't want to do that at the um, level of the artery of the Emkiewicz, and so you might put the cage in from the other side. Similarly, the uh, vascular supply of the bones uh, comes from this uh, posterior central uh, arteries, and we use that to our advantage in preoperative embolization of uh, of vascular tumors. Um, because there's connection between the, uh, the two levels or, or more levels, uh, often we embolize three above and three below with particles. Um, and we have really found a, a, a massive decrease in the uh, blood loss from doing that approach. So rather than just embolizing the, uh, the operative level, if you embolize above and below with, uh, with particles, you can really decrease the blood loss for the, uh, uh, for the surgeons doing the uh, corpectomies.
And of course, it's important to know the venous drainage. Uh, rich venous plexus important for the uh, uh, spread of metastatic disease. Uh, and again, uh, here's just a cartoon of Batson's plexus. So um, it's important to be aware of those. Uh, finally, on, on the anatomy, the arterial anatomy, it's important to know where your watershed zones are for um, either deformity correction surgery or just uh, uh, long deformity surgeries. Um, it's the uh, cervicothoracic junction, uh, the midthoracic, and then the thoracolumbar junction. So if you're going to get a spinal cord infarct from uh, prolonged surgery, lots of blood loss, hypotension, uh, that's uh, where it's going to happen. Uh, it's important to be aware of that. Uh, increased blood pressure if you start uh, noticing changes in your signals uh, with neuromonitoring, etc. Uh, adequate resuscitation during these large uh, deformity cases. So this is a, a cartoon of uh, the normal anatomy. Uh, I'll be using that as reference to a couple of these uh, uh, other spinal AVMs. So we have our um, medullary arteries coming in uh, off uh, the uh, radicular artery coming in. Uh, and this can go awry in different, uh, different ways. So the, the type 1s, if you're going to remember one type of um, uh, spinal AVM, this is one to remember because it's the by far the most common, uh, 70 to 80 percent, often a history of trauma, and, and the trauma can be 10, 20 years uh, prior to uh, presentation. And the fistula is on the nerve root sleeve with retrograde venous drainage uh, into the thecal sac with uh, venous hypertension. Uh, and this is just a cartoon of that. Uh, showing the uh, fistula on the nerve root sleeve with the dilated veins intradurally. Uh, and it can be a single feeder or it can be a multiple feeder that has implications for surgery. Uh, it's important that you know that there's two feeders because if you take one, uh, they might get a, a sort of immediate cure, but there's going to be uh, recurrence. So the classic presentation is a male, 40 to 60 years old, uh, slowly progressive, uh, uh, often back pain, leg weakness, um, and then you get the ridiculous symptoms coming later uh, and activities which can worsen with intra-abdominal pressure uh, or you can get the foie alarginine uh, with a spinal cord infarction. Um, we'll look at some of the imaging features, but before I get onto that, it's, I think it's really uh, important that if someone has these long, uh, this long history that this uh, diagnosis is kind of in the back of your mind because the vast majority of dural fistulas that I, I see uh, have had a history of at least six months, uh, often had prior spine decompression surgery, uh, and no one's really kind of looked for these uh, characteristic imaging findings. So you can see uh, central T2 changes uh, on MRI. Uh, the key thing, enlarged serpiginous uh, veins, cord swelling, uh, and cord enhancement, particularly on the uh, very surface of the cord. That can be a sign of, of a fistula. Uh, so this is this is a, uh, a myelogram uh, showing the um, uh, subarachnoid spaces are not filling normally. There's a slightly swollen cord, and if you look carefully, there's uh, some uh, dilated veins there. And so in this case, uh, a fusion is not the right thing to do uh, because it doesn't address the primary pathology, uh, and the patient will not get better. No, it was not my case. Um, and so I'll just skip across this. Um, so on the MRI, you can see here there's a diffusely swollen cord. Um, and if you look closely in the middle panel, it's a little bit hard to see with the projection. There's some dilated veins there. And that's that's a sign that you've, you've got to look further for a dural fistula. Uh, and again here, uh, you can see with a magged up view, you've got uh, a lot of dilated veins in the CSF spaces. Uh, and that can be a, a sign of a dural fistula that needs to be addressed. Uh, similarly here, another uh, positive laminectomy sign. Um, so a, a spinal decompression has been uh, performed, but um, the surgeon has failed to uh, adequately identify that there are dilated veins uh, above and below the area of the, uh, uh, the decompression, which is uh, from a uh, dural fistula. And you can see the enhancement on the, uh, on the panel on the right uh, right up against the uh, brain stem, uh, that's a dilated vein, uh, which is enhancing with contrast. So if you see a vein uh, that's uh, right up against the spinal cord, then you need to look further. Similarly with uh, time-resolved MRA, you can see uh, uh, the uh, dilated venous structures quite nicely, and that often helps us when we're going to angio, uh, because we know exactly where to look, um, rather than shooting every single vessel, which can be quite tedious. <coughs> 
So when it comes to angiograms, again, we're looking for single or multiple feeders. Uh, we're looking for a small uh, nidus uh, right at the uh, medial aspect of the intervertebral foramen. That's where you find the fistula. Uh, and a single draining vein, uh, which goes to the uh, tortuous medullary uh, system. And so if you look here, you can see uh, the point of fistulization. Right here. Uh, with a large uh, draining vein. Uh, and that can be uh, accessed uh, with a microcatheter to get a, a better picture, which is what you see on the right. Uh, so again, uh, this is the site of fistula right here uh, with the draining vein, which is serpiginous. And those are just two other examples. It's important that you shoot uh, every single vessel. Uh, this is an example of a fistula filling from an iliolumbar artery, so it's very, very low down. Uh, here and here's the uh, the feeders uh, going to the fistulous uh, fistulous portion there. So it's important that um, we shoot every single vessel when we do the spinal angiogram because sometimes you can find these uh, fistulae in uh, sort of odd locations, either coming off thoracervical, costocervical branches, or even down uh, off the iliolumbar. Differential diagnosis: cord infarction, MS, transverse myelitis, uh, tumor, trauma. And again, this is just what uh, spinal cord infarction looks like, so it's important to differentiate between the two. Uh, of course, on this one, you don't see any dilated veins around the, uh, around the area, so that points you away from a fistula. So in terms of uh, treatment, you must occlude the proximal portion of the draining vein, uh, otherwise they come back. It's not enough to just embolize or occlude the feeding artery, uh, otherwise these things come back. So for us in the lab, we've got uh, NBCA, uh, which is a glue. Onyx is kind of, uh, um, it's cohesive but not adhesive. Uh, so we can slowly inject it. It doesn't um, stick to our catheter. So we can go in there and, and slowly inject the onyx and then the catheters don't get glued in. So it's a little bit easier to use. Um, <coughs> you don't want to embolize if the medullary artery comes off the feeder. Um, similarly, you want to make sure that the anterior spinal is not involved before you embolize. Uh, and if you do surgery, uh, you have to divide the draining vein at the nerve root sleeve, and I'll show a video of that shortly. Uh, this is a case of a 55-year-old that presented with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, two negative angiograms. Uh, and you can see here there's a uh, fistula which was uh, treated by uh, surgery uh, with successful resolution of the fistula. Uh, if you look here, this is a uh, simple dural fistula. This is a very, very straightforward surgical case uh, with a very high rate of cure. You can see the vein uh, on the surface of the, of the spinal cord. And just look at the change in color as uh, this vein is uh, uh, cauterized. You see over time, uh, as we continue to bipolar this, uh, that the color of the uh, venous drainage uh, changes um, because you're, you're taking out the fistulous uh, connection. So by the time uh, we managed to bipolar and cut this, it's becoming pretty, uh, pretty purple. So as long as you get that, uh, that fistulous connection, you can see here that the color of the venous drainage uh, is uh, changing. As long as you get that fistulous connection, that's all it is. It's a very, very simple operation um, and uh, has a very low rate of recurrence. And again, that, that vein's completely changed color now. Um, so one of the things that we can do is the uh, intraoperative endocyanine green video angiography, and you can see the early venous drainage there. Uh, so when we um, use the microscope uh, with the ICG, you can see this early uh, filling of that, uh, that vein. Uh, and then once the fistula has been dealt with, you can see the venous drainage doesn't drain out. Uh, so the, there's no flow in that fistula anymore. Um, and for complex fistulas, we do uh, intraoperative angiogram. Uh, there's some technical nuances with that uh, because you're prone, so we typically have to wrap a sheath around the body. Uh, and of course, when you're doing the angiogram, everything's back to front, which can be confusing. So in terms of uh, treatment, um, liquid embolics have been used, NBCA or Onyx. Um, as I mentioned, there is some uh, recurrence, and surgery is uh, usually what I do if I can. Uh, here's just an example of uh, embolization with uh, NBCA. You can see the before and before and after. Once the glue's in, the uh, the dilated veins are gone on the uh, on the MRI. With uh, with embo with PVA, that was the original um, particles that we used. The uh, results were not good. The particles would dissolve, and you get recanalization. Uh, NBCA was then used. Uh, 
Uh, and since then, uh, Onyx has come about, and um, there's numerous uh, smaller series which have a very high rate of cure. So in the right patient, as long as you can penetrate that vein, uh, get a microcatheter right up to the, uh, that arteriovenous fistulous point, you can get a really good result with Onyx. Um, having said that, surgery has almost 100% cure rate, uh, and uh, it's a relatively straightforward operation. Uh, so um, for patients that don't want to take that chance of not having a cure uh, in a healthy patient, I go straight to surgery. So just to compare the two, spinal AVM versus dural fistula. Uh, spinal AVMs are rare. The, um, the dural fistulas are much more common. Uh, the fistulas are low flow. The AVMs are high flow. Uh, AVMs present with hemorrhage. Fistulas usually present with uh, myelopathy or slowly progressive symptoms uh, and tend to be in older patients. Um, and they tend to be found between T4 and L3. So I want to talk a little bit about glomus uh, spinal cord AVMs, usually young adults. Um, it's a discrete lesion within the spinal cord. Um, the mortality rate when these things bleed is really high, 18%. They re-bleed 10% uh, in the first month, 40%. Uh, in the first year. So these, these are bad news. Uh, and here's just uh, an example on the MRI. Uh, the cord is kind of wrapped around these things. They're intimately involved. Uh, it can be very, very uh, difficult to, uh, to deal with surgically. And that's just a cartoon demonstrating you've got a single feeder usually, uh, and the nidus is tightly packed with normal spinal cord uh, around it. It's important to uh, differentiate your other um, uh, uh, causes of or hemorrhage in the in the um, in the spinal cord. So your uh, uh, metastatic tumors that can bleed, like melanoma, um, uh, ependymoma, uh, some other gliomas, which can look very similar on the uh, MRI. Um, you can see myelomalacia, cord edema, uh, involvement of extradural structures. I'll show that shortly. Um, and the MRI again shows uh, enlarged venous structures. So here's just some pictures of what it can look like. Um, this can look like uh, some of those vascular lesions that can bleed as well. So it's important to scan the whole brain. Uh, things like ependymoma uh, or astrocytoma can uh, metastasize to the spine. Uh, last week we saw a glioblastoma that had metastasized to the spine. That's incredibly rare, um, but it can happen. Uh, and again, you see the uh, dilated veins um, on the MRI. Time resolved uh, MRA looks something like this. It's pretty hard to miss. So we get enlarged uh, anterior or posterior spinal arteries. Uh, you can see the, uh, the nidus pretty clearly on the angio with rapid shunting. And sometimes you see perinidal aneurysms, and that is associated with a much higher risk of hemorrhage. Uh, and so this is just uh, some examples uh, of these uh, type 2 uh, uh, AVMs. Uh, with feeders from um, usually one, but sometimes uh, multiple vessels. Uh, here's an example of a case with a um, with an associated aneurysm. See here. Uh, so these ones have a much higher rate of uh, hemorrhage. Again, it's important to look at uh, all vessels uh, as they can be. Um, uh, filling from multiple uh, different locations. And it's important to uh, do an angiogram of the whole spinal axis so that you can uh, identify where your anterior spinal artery is um, and your uh, artery vadempcuates with the uh, characteristic hip and loop. Uh, the type 3s and type 4s, I'm just going to mention just so you kind of have an awareness of, about them. They're extremely rare. Uh, the type 3s can involve both intradural and uh, extradural uh, components, and if the whole metameric segment is involved, it's called Cobb syndrome, uh, and they can present with uh, hemorrhage or compression type symptoms. Um, and this is a uh, an example of the MR. You get um, this AVM which extends not only in the spinal cord but out into the soft tissues, the bone and the muscle, uh, all in that uh, same segment. It's usually uh, young adults or uh, adolescents. And here's just another uh, example. Um, the juvenile uh, type AVM, um, I don't know why that has come back in. That's the type 2. Uh, so I'll just move along. Okay, the perimidallary or type 4 uh, fistulas, that's the last one. 
Um, these are much less common, about 5 to 10 percent of cases. Uh, and this is where you get a fistula between the artery and the vein without an intervening nidus. Um, unfortunately, they tend to be uh, fed off the anterior spinal, which makes them surgically much more difficult to get at, uh, particularly in the, um, in the thoracic spine. It's hard to kind of reach around, uh, and so often you might need to combine it with a fusion um, or uh, a pretty radical uh, decompression in order to get around the front. So these can often be sort of combined cases with uh, vascular or a vascular neurosurgeon as well as a, a, a complex spine surgeon. They're uncommon, uh, usually in, in younger patients. Um, and again, this is the cartoon kind of just demonstrating it goes straight from an artery to a vein uh, without an um, intervening nidus. Most are on the ventral surface uh, and typically supplied by the anterior spinal. So this is what makes it even more tricky because if you take the anterior spinal, you're going to paralyze the patient. So often uh, one of the things you can do is um, uh, either uh, do the um, super selective injections where we can essentially numb the spinal cord uh, with the patient awake um, during a spinal angiogram, uh, kind of like a, an amatol test with, uh, um, uh, that we do for epilepsy. Uh, so you can uh, paralyze the spinal cord uh, or see if the patient can still move their feet while you're doing the angiogram with a super selective injection uh, of, uh, of medicine into the uh, anterior spinal. And that tells you where the patient's going to tolerate having that vessel taken, either with embolization or at surgery. Uh, similarly, your neurological monitoring at surgery can be used to see whether they're going to tolerate that. Um, skip over that. And here's just an example that right on the surface of the, of the cord. Kojo's lingering with intent, so I'm, I, I'm going to move things along. Um, okay, I think we've got one more thing to talk about. Yeah, basically, the summary of surgical intervention for these is not great, um, but the outcomes are not particularly uh, good if you've already had a hemorrhage anyway. So um, with appropriate angiography, you can select out which patients are going to do well from embo or surgery. Um, with the type 4s, uh, reasonable outcome, 90% improved or stable. Uh, if it's on the back of the spinal cord, you can operate on those pretty safely. If it's on the front, we tend to try and embolize those because they're hard to get to surgically. Um, and finally, I'll just mention one more type. Um, this is usually seen after trauma. The extradural AV fistula, this is where you get a direct fistulous uh, connection uh, between usually the vertebral artery um, and the epidural venous plexus. Um, typically happens after trauma, uh, but you can see it in Alice Danlos. Uh, we had a patient last week that presented a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, where there was a fistula directly off the V4 segment of the vertebral artery into the perivenous plexus there, um, and that was treated with embolization effectively. But it's just another one to be uh, kind of aware of, uh, and that's typically seen with uh, dilated veins around the uh, vertebral artery. You can get compression of the spinal cord, um, and in rare cases they can present with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, we can usually treat this endovascularly now. We've got a range of techniques for doing that. So in conclusion, uh, non-invasive imaging is important for the identification of uh, spinal cord AVMs, but the angiography is the key thing which drives whether we uh, do endovascular or open surgery. Uh, MRA is pretty good, particularly the TRIX protocol is, is uh, a good protocol for identifying where the fistula is, which helps us uh, know where to put our catheter. Uh, but appropriate early recognition, uh, particularly of the dural fistulas, uh, is key, and the median time to diagnosis is about six months for those, uh, and those are the ones that are going to get you in trouble when you go out into practice, um, is doing the uh, lumbar decompression on a guy with a dural fistula. So I just want to re-emphasize that. So now that Kojo's uh, lingering with intent, I'll stop there. <laughs>